think the last step about the I'll, I'll let everyone know. Chief Justice of Victoria, the Honourable Marilyn Warren, Lord and Lady Walker, Heads of Jurisdiction and other distinguished members of the Victorian and Federal Judiciary, Attorney General of Victoria, the Honourable Robert Clark, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. Good evening. My name is Carolyn Evans. I'm the Dean of the Melbourne Law School. And on behalf of the Law School and the Victoria Law Foundation, it's my very great pleasure to welcome you here this evening for the annual Law Oration to be given by Lord Walker on developing the common law, how far is too far. I begin by acknowledging that we meet today on the traditional lands of the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nations and pay our respects to their elders past and present. Ladies and gentlemen, tonight's proceeding, including question time, will be recorded uh, and available after the event. The annual law oration is a collaboration between Melbourne Law School and the Victoria Law Foundation. Speaking for the law school, we greatly appreciate the chance to work with our colleagues in the foundation to bring out high quality speakers to present on important issues of law, justice and the legal system. Both of our organisations, in their different ways, understand the importance of informed, thoughtful, nuanced public discussion on legal matters. And tonight should be a particularly fine example of the long tradition of common law countries learning from one another's experience and wisdom. Both the Foundation and the Law School extend our thanks to the Chief Justice and to the judges of the Supreme Court for allowing us to host this evening's event in surroundings so very suitable for both the speaker and the topic. It's now my pleasure to call upon the Honourable Philip Cummins, who wears, as most of you know, many hats, but is here tonight as Chair of the Victoria Law Foundation to introduce our distinguished speaker and to chair tonight's proceedings. Chief Justice Warren and Heads of Jurisdiction, Attorney General, Your Honours, Professor Evans and our many guests. Lord Walker was called to the bar at Lincoln's Inn in 1960. He had a distinguished and successful career at the Chancery Bar, taking silk in 1982. He was appointed to the High Court of Justice in 1994, sitting in the Chancery Division, he was elevated to be a Lord Justice of Appeal in 1997, and elevated again to be a Lord of Appeal in Ordinary in 2002. Upon the establishment of the Supreme Court of the United Kingdom on the 1st of October 2009, Lord Walker became an inaugural justice of that court, which judicial office he holds today. We are honoured and delighted that Lord Walker graciously has agreed to present the 2012 law oration this evening. Far from London, Last month, I was on the Birdsville track in Western Queensland, thinking about the common law. To the east, to the east of the Birdsville track lies Sturt's stony desert, which after occasional rain comes to flowering life, just as does the common law by judicial creativity. To the west of the track lies the Simpson Desert, with its high, always parallel sand dunes, symbolising the analogical method of developing the common law. Lord Walker this evening will ask of the common law the question prudent travellers ask of the Birdsville track, how far is too far? <laughs> I respectfully invite Lord Walker to present the oration. Chief Justice Warren, Heads of Jurisdiction, Attorney General, Your Honours, Professor Evans, Ladies and Gentlemen, 
It is a great joy to be in Melbourne again, especially on such a wonderful spring day. And it's a great honor to be invited to give this oration, especially in front of such a very distinguished audience. I'm grateful to, Philip, to Professor Evans and Philip Cummins uh, for their kind welcome to me. In Kleinwort Benson and Lincoln City Council, Lord Goff addressed the question of when a judge, in practice it would usually be the collegiate decision of a final appeal court, should effect changes in the common law. Nowadays, Lord Goff said, he derives much assistance from academic writings in interpreting statutes and more especially the effect of reported cases. He has regard where appropriate to decisions of judges in other jurisdictions. In deciding the case before him, he may on occasion develop the common law in the perceived interests of justice. Though as a general rule he does so, in the words of Justice Holmes, only interstitially, that is by filling in gaps. This means not only that he must act within the confines of the doctrine of precedent, but that the change so made must be seen as a development, usually a very modest development of existing principle, and so can take its place as a congruent part of the common law as a whole. Occasionally, a judicial development of the law will be of a more radical nature, constituting a departure, even a major departure, from what has previously been considered to be established principle, and leading to a realignment of subsidiary principles within that branch of law. These are just two short ex extracts from a luminous speech which led the way in making a radical change in the English common law rule as to mistake of law. The speech as a whole is a good introduction to my topic this evening. Lord Goff was an eminent legal scholar as well as a distinguished judge. And as one of the founding fathers of the English law of unjust enrichment, he had strong feelings about mistake of law. He regarded the traditional English rule on mistake of law as antiquated, irrational, and out of step with Commonwealth authority. Nevertheless, in his speech, he carefully considered not only the arguments in favor of change, but also a number of principled, uh, principled objections to significant changes in the common law being made by judges. The objections include, first, the uncertainty that may arise as to the scope and limits of any change. Judges are not legislators, and even the highest appeal court must hesitate before laying down the law in a way that goes far beyond the facts of the particular case before it. Second, there is the court's lack of access to and lack of capacity to process the complex economic, social, and scientific data by which much modern legislation is influenced. Thirdly, there is the declaratory, or to be realistic, retrospective character of judge-made changes in law. A retrospective change in the law may cause hardship, possibly amounting to injustice, to large numbers of people who are not concerned in the litigation. Whether the court can avoid such hardship by directing that its, judge, that its judgment shall be prospective only, that is, that its effect should be limited to future events, is an issue of some difficulty. The fourth objection is the most important of all, and to some extent it underpins all the others. In a representative democracy, changes in the law are in principle a matter for Parliament, often acting on the advice of an expert law reform commission and not for unelected judges. I want to examine these points by reference to a number of topics on which the United Kingdom's highest appeal tribunal, the House of Lords until mid-2009, and since then the Supreme Court, has been asked to make significant changes in the common law. In some of those cases it has declined to do so. In others it has made significant changes, 
and at least one of them, the mesothelioma cases, starting with Fairchild, we may now be wondering already whether we took the right course. That is partly because of a swift parliamentary intervention which greatly widened the scope of the judge-made change in the common law. Some may see the episode as a cautionary tale of one arm of government not knowing or understanding what the other arm was about. In speaking of the common law, I do not exclude the body of non-statutory law that we call equity. One of the areas that I shall touch on briefly is concerned with developing the principles and doctrines of equity. It might perhaps be said that the biggest of all the questions as to the future development of non-statutory law is whether it is possible and desirable to achieve, I hesitate to use the F word, the fusion of common law and equity. This is a complex and controversial topic, not least in Australia, and you will forgive me if I don't, think, don't even think of going there this evening. Most of the topics that I shall be discussing are issues that have arisen in Australia and other Commonwealth jurisdictions, as well as in England. This is a reminder that we can no longer refer, if we speak accurately, to the common law. We have the common law of Australia, the common law of Anglophone Canada, the common law of England, and the common law of New Zealand, quite apart from the position in the United States of America. This was explicitly recognized in the Invercargill case in 1996, when New Zealand's court of last resort was still the judicial committee of the Privy Council. In an appeal about the tortious liability of official building inspectors for latent defects in buildings, the judicial committee recognized that the common law of New Zealand had diverged from English law and that it was the former that the Privy Council had to state and apply, saying in the judgment, in the present case, the judges in the New Zealand Court of Appeal were consciously departing from English case law on the grounds that conditions in New Zealand are different. Were they entitled to do so, the answer must surely be yes. The ability of the common law to adapt itself to the differing circumstances of the countries in which it has taken root is not a weakness, but one of its great strengths. The judgment went on to refer to the position in Australia and in Canada. The first topic I want to look at is the law of evidence, and in particular two common law privileges which have been under scrutiny in recent years. Witness privilege as, enjoy, as enjoyed by expert witnesses, and the principle against self-incrimination, especially as involved in civil proceedings arising out of large-scale commercial fraud or piracy of intellectual property rights. The justification for the general immunity of witnesses is to enable them to give their testimony frankly and fearlessly, subject only to the criminal sanction of perjury. In relation to expert witnesses, the privilege originally served mainly as a protection against a civil action for defamation brought by someone on the other side who was aggrieved by the evidence. In the 19th century case of Seaman and Nethercliffe, the defendant was a handwriting expert who had given evidence in a probate action that the propounded will was a forgery. The judge was critical of his evidence and the jury found for the validity of the will. Shortly afterwards, Mr. Nethercliffe gave evidence for the defense in a criminal case and was asked in cross-examination if he was aware of the judge's comments in the earlier case. The cross-examiner then stopped, but the witness went on to explain, I believe that will to be a rank forgery, and I will believe it to the day of my death. For these remarks, Mr. Seaman, an attorney who had witnessed the will in question, sued him for slander. The judge, Lord, uh, Lord Chief Justice Coleridge, said that the witness's remark had been ill-advised, but held that he was entitled to witness immunity. It was only in the second half of the 20th century, with the development of tortious liability for negligent misstatement, that expert witnesses found themselves liable to be sued, not by the other side, but by their own lay clients. The expert might have been instructed primarily to advise on finding a solution to a particular problem, rather than solely with a view to giving evidence in court. But that difficult demarcation problem did not arise in Jones and Caney. 
Mr. Jones had suffered physical and psychiatric injuries in a road traffic accident. Liability was admitted, but quantum was in dispute, especially in relation to post-traumatic stress disorder. Ms. Caney, a consultant clinical psychologist, was instructed as an expert witness for Mr. Jones. She discussed the matter with the other side's expert on the telephone and then signed a joint report drafted by the other expert, which was very damaging to her client's case. She said she had been put under pressure to confer in statements which did not represent her professional opinion. Mr. Jones was not allowed to make a last minute change of expert and had to settle for a relatively low sum. He sued Ms. Caney for breach of a duty of care owed to him. Those were the circumstances in which her claim to witness privilege was challenged in a leapfrog appeal to the Supreme Court. The arguments for maintaining the privilege were the traditional ones already mentioned, the need to protect honest witnesses from harassment and encourage frank and fearless testimony. On the other side was the need to avoid injustice. As Lord Wilberforce had said over 20 years before, immunity from action depends upon public policy. In fixing its boundary, account must be taken of the counter policy that a wrong ought not to be without a remedy. The outcome was a decision by five to two to end the privilege for expert witnesses. The majority took the view that the privilege can no longer be justified for remunerated professionals who are able to protect themselves by insurance and that there is a strong reason to think and that there is no strong reason to think that the withdrawal of immunity would have a chilling effect on the readiness of professional men and women to act as expert witnesses. I must, however, add that some commentators have suggested that even before Jones and Caney, pediatricians had been less willing to give evidence in chick cases of suspected child abuse in consequence of the decision in Meadow and the General Medical Council decided by the Court of Appeal in 2006. In that case, witness immunity was held not to protect an eminent pediatrician from being struck off the register after he had given evidence for the prosecution at the trial of Miss, Mrs. Sally Clark. She was convicted in 1999 of the murder of her two infant sons who died in their cots in 1996 and 1998. Her conviction was eventually set aside. The pediatrician's evidence was gravely flawed in that he gave unsound evidence about statistics and probabilities, topics in which he had no expertise. In the important case of daughter Ekonaike, the High Court of, uh, of Australia on appeal from the Court of Appeal of Victoria considered and affirmed the immunity of advocates, Justice Kirby <coughs> expressing no opinion as to work in court and dissenting as to work out of court. The judgments are lengthy and full of interest, but for present purposes I note that the decision also reaffirms witness immunity and sees both immunities as based on the need for, for finality in litigation. This is emphasized in the judgment of the plurality, who said, a central and pervading tenant of the judicial system is that controversies once resolved are not to be reopened except in a few narrowly defined circumstances. This is in striking contrast to the judgments in Jones and Caney in which finality and the need to avoid collateral litigation receive only a passing mention in one judgment. Bowell and the Queen is another recent decision of the High Court of Australia which attaches special weight to finality. I do not recognize the same tendency in recent United Kingdom jurisprudence, possibly because we have in the last 20 or 30 years had so many serious miscarriages of criminal justice, including not only Mrs. Clark, but also the Birmingham Six and the Guildford Three. In his dissenting judgment in Daughter Econiaki, Justice Kirby made some observations that might be thought to anticipate the, the majority view in Jones and Caney. He also agreed with some observations of Lord Hoffman as to whether the issue of advocates' immunity should be left to Parliament. Lord Hoffman had said, I do not think your Lordship would be intervening in matters that should be left to Parliament. The judges created the immunity 
and the judges should say that the grounds for maintaining it no longer exist. In 2007, the issue of an ex the immunity of an expert witness was confirmed by the Court of Appeal of New South Wales in Commonwealth and Griffiths. Judges in all common law jurisdictions have been more reluctant to interfere with the privilege against self-incrimination. It too was, I suppose, created by judges, although as the distinguished editor of the Australian decision of Cross on Evidence comments, its origins are remarkably bit, uh, obscure. It has historically had a central position in English law and civil liberties. But as Lord Mustill observed in 1992 in an appeal about the statutory powers of the director of the Serious Fraud Office, nevertheless it is clear that statutory interference with the right is almost as old as the right itself. Since the 16th century, legislation has established an inquisitorial form of investigation into the dealings and assets of bankrupts, which is calculated to yield potentially incriminating material. And in more recent times, there have been many other examples in widely separated fields, which are probably more numerous than is generally appreciated. Lord Mustill went on to explain that these statutory exceptions differed in their aims and their methods, including their drafting techniques. At that date, some but not all of them provided that information obtained under com compulsion should not be admissible in any criminal proceedings. This safeguard was extended to others by amending legislation in advance of the coming into force of the UK Human Rights Act. In a recent appeal to the Supreme Court, we were shown a list, a list of 25 statutory exceptions to immunity from self-incrimination, and counsel did not guarantee that the list was exhaustive. The majority of these have the general legislative aim of obtaining information for the purposes of civil proceedings, including insolvency proceedings, arising out of commercial fraud or copyright piracy. In these cases, there is a strong countervailing public interest in victims of serious fraud or piracy obtaining an effective civil remedy. But in every case, the immunity has been curtailed by statute, and the House of Lords has disapproved of any attempt by judges to fashion equivalent non-statutory procedures, even with added safeguards. As Lord Newberger, the Master of the, when Master of the Rolls, put it in the Court of Appeal in a, a, the recent case, which was concerned with breaches of duties of confidence by phone hacking. Lord Newberger refers to the privilege as PSI. He said, I would take this opportunity to express my support for the view that PSI has had its day, provided that its removal is made subject to a safeguard against the admission of the material in criminal proceedings. Whether or not one has that opinion, however, it is undoubtedly the case that Save to the extent that it's been cut down by statute, PSI remains a part of the common law, and that it is for the legislature, not the judiciary, to remove it or cut it down. The position in Australia is similar. Any curtailment of a general civil, civil liberty is preeminently a matter for Parliament, and although there are numerous statutory exceptions, they must be in clear words. As was said by the High Court in Sorby, the privilege against self-incrimination is deeply ingrained in the common law. The privilege is that the statute will not be construed to take away a common law right, including the privilege against self-incrimination, unless a legislative intent to do so clearly emerges, whether by express words or necessary implication. I now turn to substantive law, and I want to begin with the extraordinarily swift development of the English law of personal privacy. The speed of change has been remarkable, not least because in Wainwright and the Home Office decided in 2003, the House of Lords firmly rejected an invitation to extend the common law and gave as one of their reasons the coming into force of the Human Rights Act 1998. Wainwright was a claim by a middle-aged mother and her son, a young man with learning difficulties, who had been humiliatingly strip-searched when visiting her other son in prison. 
These events occurred before the Act came into force on the 2nd of, dis, dis, of October 2000. Lord Hoffman observed, there seems to me a great difference between identifying privacy as a value which underlies the existence of a rule of law and may point the direction in which the law should develop and privacy as a principle of law in itself. This is an area which requires a detailed approach which can be achieved only by legislation rather than the broad brush of common law principle. Furthermore, the coming into force of the Human Rights Act 1998 weakens the argument for saying that a general tort of invasion of privacy is needed to fill gaps in the existing remedies. But paradoxically, as events have turned out, the Human Rights Act has been the driving force behind this development of the common law. The Act imposes a statutory duty on public authorities not to act in a way that is incompatible with a convention right, that is, a right under the European Convention on Human Rights. But the national press and its suppliers, the paparazzi and the private eyes, powerful as they are, are not public authorities, and so the Act did not provide a direct remedy against even the most blatant in invasions of privacy by the press. But an indirect route emerged. During the interval about two years between, between the passing of the Act and its coming into, into force, there was a vigorous debate among United Kingdom legal scholars between the verticalists and the horizontalists. The verticalists saw the Act as having top-down effect only between the state and its emanations on the one hand and the citizen on the other hand. The horizontalists saw it as affecting legal relations between citizens and non-public non bodies also. The statutory duty to construe legislation compatibly with convention rights certainly extends that far because it's quite general. In addition, the horizontalists argued that because under the UK Act, unlike the Charter of Human Rights and Responsibilities of Victoria, the term public authority is defined as including the court, the court is under a further statutory duty to mould and extend the common law if necessary to ensure that the court's own decisions are compatible with convention rights. This view, although supported by some eminent academics, including the late Sir William Wade, was generally regarded with skepticism and does not seem to have been put forward in argument in any of the early cases. But it was deployed and was, effected, uh, and was accepted in principle by the Court of Appeal in the case of A against B, PLC. In that case, the anonymized plaintiff, a celebrity footballer and a married man, the first of many such footballers to tread that path, sought an injunction to restrain publication of a news story about his sexual indiscretions. Lord Wolfe stated, the court's approach to the issues which the applications raise has been modified because under section six of the 1998 Act, the court as a public authority is required not to act in a way which is incompatible with a convention right. The court is able to achieve this by absorbing the rights which Articles 8, right to private and family life, and 10, freedom of expression, protect into the long-established action for breach of confidence. This involves giving a new strength and breadth to the action so that it accommodates the requirements of those articles. So the new right is founded on principle. It's a development from the long established action for breach of confidence, which had since the 19th century at latest been available for the protection of trade secrets and much more rarely, confidential matters of a personal nature. An important intermediate step in its development was the decision of the House of Lords in the Spycatcher case, Attorney General against Guardian Newspapers Number 2. As many of you will remember, that case was concerned with the memoirs of a former British counter-espionage officer, then retired and living in Australia, whose book Spycatcher was eventually published in 1987. That was only after fiercely fought litigation in the Supreme Court of New South Wales, in which the British Cabinet Secretary was cross-examined by Mr. Malcolm Turnbull. The case ended in the High Court of Australia, but for present purposes, the point to note is that in later proceedings in England, 
the House of Lords restated the law of confidence in very general terms, not necessarily dependent on a pre-existing pre contractual or fiduciary relationship. But the Lords refused any further injunction because the, rel the relevant information was already irretrievably in the public domain. In A against B PLC, the English Court of Appeal recognized the principle of privacy but discharged the judge's injunction on the ground that there was a sufficient public interest in the footballer's adultery being disclosed. The, talk, the court took the opportunity of laying down 15 guidelines as to how the court should strike the balance. The guidelines uh, were, it must be said, rather prescriptive and detailed for that early stage in the development of the law. One's perhaps reminded of what Clemenceau said about Woodrow Wilson's 14 principles uh, at the Conference of Versailles, le bon Dieu soi-même n'avait que dix. The guidelines have, have not all been followed. In particular, later authorities do not attach much significance to the claimant being a role model for the young. As the law and practice have developed since the decision of the House of Lords in the case of the celebrity model Naomi Campbell, more significance has been attached to whether a celebrity claimant is in truth more concerned with preserving his commercial sponsorship contracts than with protecting his family, or whether he's made unfounded suggestions of blackmail against someone with whom he's had an, a liaison or has previously public de publicly denied the aberrant conduct, such as use of cocaine, which the press has disclosed or wishes to disclose. The development of this branch of the law in England has undoubtedly been accelerated by the egregious conduct of the British press and the readiness of the legal profession to encourage highly paid footballers, television personalities and other celebrities to seek prior restraint in the form of an ex party injunction, which sometimes prohibits publication even of the fact of the injunction being granted. These so-called super injunctions, secret justice, you might say, available only to the super rich, have raised serious issues which were addressed last year by the Lord Chief Justice and the Master of the Rolls. Some high-profile occasions on which ex party injunctions have been discharged for material non-disclosure together with the truly remarkable public inquiry now being conducted by Lord Justice Leveson seem to have calmed the frenzy. The leading Australian authorities in this area are the decisions of the High Court in ABC against Lena Game Meats, the case about filming a possum processing factory, and ABC and O'Neill, the case of allegations of murder against a man already convicted of multiple murders. These cases will be well known to you all, and it would not be appropriate for me to discuss them in detail, even if time allowed. But it is worth noting that in the Lena Gay Meats case, Chief Justice Gleeson suggested as a test of personal confidentiality whether disclosure would be highly offensive to a reasonable person of ordinary sensibilities, probably a rather more stringent test than the English test of a reasonable expectation of privacy. O'Neill is of particular in interest for the scholarly but trenchant exposition by Justice Hayden of the rule in Bonnard and Perriman. That long-standing rule in the law of defamation, no prior restraint where the defendant intends to plead justification, may need to be revisited in England in relation to the threatened publication of lurid personal alleg allegations which may be actionable whether they are false or true. Next, I want to say something about causation in the law of negligence, and in particular, the debate about equating exposure of risk with actionable loss. In most common law jurisdictions, the tort of negligence has in general received relatively little statutory codification or development, although the Parliament of New South Wales has, following the IP report, undertaken the heroic task of formulating principles of causation in statutory form. Both the House of Lords and the High Court of Australia have been invited but have de declined to make a radical departure in the field of clinical negligence. 
The problem is that of late diagnosis of illness and its causal effect. In the English case, Greg and Scott, there was, as a result of a general practitioner's error, a delay of nine months in the diagnosis of can cancer of a lymph, lymph gland in a 43-year-old man. In the Australian case, Tabbitt and Get, there was a delay of only 24 hours, but potentially a crucial 24 hours, in a six-year-old girl being examined by CT scan and EEG. In each case, the finding on the expert evidence was that there was less than an even chance that early diagnosis would have led to the patient's recovery. In each case, the court declined to accede to an argument that the loss of a chance approach should be adopted in the context of clinical negligence. Loss of a chance is a familiar approach in claims for pure economic loss, such as a claim against a lawyer for carelessly permitting his client's cause of action to become statute barred. But it would have been a momentous step to bring it into the field of personal injuries. In Greg and Scott decided in 2005 that House of Lords was split 3-2. Lord Nichols, who with Lord, Hope was in the minor who with Lord Hope was in the minority, saw it as a case of obvious injustice which the court should correct and not leave to Parliament. But the majority viewed the proposed change as going beyond the judicial function. Lord Hoffman quoted the words, the words of Lord Nichols himself in Fairchild. Uh, Lord Nichols had said, to be acceptable, the law must be coherent. It must be principled. The basis on which one case or one type of case is distinguished from another should be transparent and capable of identification. When a decision departs from principles normally applied, the basis for doing so must be rational and justifiable if the decision is to avoid the, the, the reproach that hard cases made bad law. Lord Hoffman added, I respectfully agree, and in my opinion, the various control mechanisms proposed to confine liability to loss of a chance within artificial limits do not pass this test. A wholesale adoption of possible rather than po probable causation as the, condition of, uh, as the criterion of liability would be so radical a change in our law as to amount to a legislative act it would have enormous consequences for insurance companies and the National Health Service. In company with the others in the majority, I think that any such change should be left to Parliament. In Tabbot and Get, decided five years later, the High Court was unanimous. Almost the whole of the Court saw the proposed change as a radical step which would alter the traditional balance between plaintiff and defendant in clinical negligence cases. In Fairchild, by contrast, the House of Lords did develop a new principle of causation to deal with the particular problem caused by mesothelioma. It is a form of cancer which affects mesothelial cells lining the internal chest wall. It is invariably fatal. Other features of the disease is that it has a very long period of latency. The minimum period is sometimes put at 10 years and cannot be detected until it has reached an advanced stage. The consequence is that a workman who in the course of his working life is exposed to asbestos in several different employments may eventually develop mesothelioma and on the scientific view prevalent in the United Kingdom, there may be no way of identifying the period of employment during which the fatal inhalation of asbestos occurred. All the employers exposed the unfortunate workman to the risk of, risk of a fatal disease, and one at least must have been legally responsible for it, but in many cases it is impossible on a traditional approach to legal causation to prove which is responsible. In those circumstances, the House of Lords decided to adopt a new rule, narrowly circumscribed, to avoid injustice to claimants. All the law lords, but Perhaps Lord Roger in particular were conscious of the difficulty of setting the limits of a judge-made rule. Lord Roger observed, identifying at an abstract level the defining characteristics of the case, cases where it is nonetheless proper to apply the principle is far from easy. The common law naturally and traditionally shies away from such generalizations, especially in a developing area of the law. There was one point potentially of crucial importance that the law lords deliberately refrained from deciding. 
Although there were two other separate appeals heard and reported together with Fairchild, in none of them was the court asked to, to determine whether liability, if established, was joint and several, and if several, how damages were to be apportioned between the defendants. This was, it seems, because all the risks were covered by solvent insurers who had already agreed on apportionment of the damages if they were awarded. Lord Hoffman noted this point was not before the House and should be left for consideration when it arose. The point did arise, as was inevitable, three years later in Barker and Chorus, another group of cases in which some of the employers and, more importantly, their insurers were insolvent so that informal apportionment between all employers was not feasible. The House of Lords decided by four to one, with Lord Roger dissenting, that there was not joint liability, but several liability for an apportioned part. The majority considered that, that this several liability was a principal solution. Lord Roger vigorously dissented, asking why the majority was spontaneously embarking on this adventure of redefining the nature of the damage suffered by the victims. He referred to the rule that a tort feeser who is jointly liable may in practice have to bear more than his fair share of the damages and continued. Now the House is deciding that in this particular enclave of the law, the risk of the insolvency of a wrongdoer or his insurer is to bypass the other wrongdoers and their insurers and to be shouldered entirely by the innocent claimant. As a result, claimants will often end up with only a small proportion of the damages which would normally be payable for their loss. The desirability of the courts rather than Parliament throwing this lifeline to wrongdoers and their insurers at the expense of claimants is not obvious to me. Parliament agreed with Lord Roger and reversed this decision very promptly, and it has to be said with very little consultation. There was a suitable bill before Parliament, and within a matter of weeks, an amendment to the bill was introduced. It became Section 3 of the Compensation Act 2006, which imposes on each tort visa joint and several liability for the whole of the damage caused by mesothelioma. The result of this combination of common law development and statutory extension can be seen in Sinkovitz and Brief, on which Professor Jane Stapleton, who has, of course, a worldwide reputation in this area of the law, has made some trenchant comments. If we stand back, it is not easy to discern from the pronouncements of the House of Lords and the Supreme Court in the different areas which I've looked at any clear consensus as to what is and what is not off limits for the development of the common law by a court of last resort. A lot seems to depend on judicial intuition, and judicial intuitions seem to vary. But the cases suggest that it is common law rules which might be described as lawyer's law, such as witness immunity or mistake of law, that the judges are most ready to develop. Lord Goff had passionately held views about mistake of law, but it's a topic that is not much talked about on the Clapham bus or the Glen Iris tram. Conversely, issues which potentially have large social and economic consequences, such as causation in clinical negligence and industrial diseases, are best left to Parliament. Sometimes, however, governments are reluctant to bring forward measures res responding to a perceived social problem. There may be various reasons for this, including congestion of the legislative program, lack of consensus as to the correct solution, or simply a feeling that controversial legislation might be a vote loser rather than a vote winner. A striking example of this in the United Kingdom is the real social problem of unmarried cohabitants who, being young and in love, buy a house or flat with no clear agreement or understanding, either written or oral, as to the beneficial ownership of the property. If in due course the relationship ends in tears, the question of beneficial ownership of what is almost certainly their most valuable asset may have to be resolved in court by expensive litigation which neither side can afford. Many common law countries, including most of the states of Australia, have enacted laws giving the court a statutory discretion to resolve these issues in cases where the cohabitation has achieved a degree of stability, such as after two years' duration or shorter if the couple have a child. 
In England, the Law Commission has considered this issue at length, but has failed to find a solution it can recommend to Parliament. Parliament has therefore done nothing. In these circumstances, the Court has had no option but to try to develop trust law concepts to provide a solution. The problems of trying to balance fairness of outcome with predictability of outcome are formidable. The latest case is the decision of the Supreme Court in jo Jones and Kernot, not to be confused with Jones and Caney that I mentioned earlier. Our efforts have met with less than universal approbation, to say the least, from legal scholars. But it is not open to judges faced with a difficult question to say pass. The same can be said with even more conviction as to issues which, often as a result of advances in medicine, human biology and biochemistry, raise difficult and controversial ethical questions. Human fertilization and embryology, surrogacy, genetic modification, assisted suicide, and indeed the very definition of death. In the United Kingdom, Parliament has passed fairly comprehensive legislation in the field of human fertilization and embryology, although the swift advance of science and technology in this area has already raised some difficult questions as to the meaning and application of the statutory provisions and led to an amending statute. In the field of human mortality, by contrast, Parliament has shown a marked re reluctance either to clarify or to change the law. The Mental Capacity Act 2005 has given some statutory guidance as to determining what is the best interest of an incapable individual. But apart from that, there is no statutory guidance as to the circumstances in which medical professions, in which medical professionals can take action, such as sw switching off life support equipment, that will bring about the death of a patient for whom, as many would think, continued life appears to have no meaning, purpose, or value. It is now 23 years since the Hillsborough football stadium disaster, in which many died and many more suffered serious injuries. One of those most seriously injured was Tony Bland, then aged 17. He was crushed and suffered hypoxic brain damage, which reduced him to a persistent vegetative state. His brain stem remained alive, but the cortex of his brain was completely inactive. He could breathe without mechanical support, so there was no question of switching off life support system, uh, life support equipment. If his death was to be brought about, it had to be by the withdrawal of nutrition and hydration. The final extinction of his life would be slow and distressing to those who were caring for him. Tony Bland himself was incapable of feeling anything. That was the chilling issue that the House of Lords had to face almost 20 years ago. It's also arisen, uh, arisen in other common law jurisdictions. I do not propose to discuss the arguments or the obvious intellectual embarrassment which the House of Lords found in discussing the distinction elusive in this context between acts and omissions. But I draw attention to Lord Mustill's observations as to the role of the court. Uh, Lord Mustill, uh, referring to the possibility of the creation of a new common law exception to the offence of murder, said this approach would have would have had the great attraction of recognizing that the law has been left behind by rapid advances in medical technology. By starting with a clean slate, the law would be freed from the piecemeal expedients to which the courts throughout the common law world have been driven when trying to fill the gap between old law and new medicine. It has, has however, been rightly acknowledged by counsel that this is a step which the courts could not properly take any necessary changes would have to take account of the whole of this area of law and morals, including, of course, all the issues commonly grouped under the heading of euthanasia. The formulation of the necessary broad social and moral policy is an enterprise which the courts have neither the means nor, in my opinion, the right to perform. This can only be achieved by democratic process through the medium of parliament. That was nearly 20 years ago, and as I've already noticed, there's since then been almost no legislative act activity in this sens sensitive area. <coughs> More recently, assisted suicide has been considered by the House of Lords in the cases of Mrs. Pretty and Mrs. Purdy. In each case, the House was unanimous that any change in the law was a matter of Parliament. All that was achieved in the latter case 
was the direction to, to the Director of Public Prosecutions to publish a clarification of his policy as to the prosecution of a person who assisted in the suicide of a mortally ill spouse or relative. In conclusion, I repeat that judges cannot simply say pass. In the absence of legislative action, they must resolve judicial uh, justiciable issues brought before them, however much they may feel that parliamentary intervention would have been the better and more democratic course. As Lord Bingham said in another sensitive case about childcare, it is ultimately the duty of the court to give effect to its own judgment. What Lord Bingham said is, that is what it is there for. Once the jurisdiction of the court is invoked, its clear duty is to reach and express the best judgment it can. So sometimes when Parliament refrains from addressing a new problem, the court has no option but to give the best judgment that it can. Well, I, I think they do have an important and proper role and function. I, I, I think that experience in, in many common law and, and indeed non-common law jurisdictions has shown that there is a proper constitutional place for a law reform commission to consider changes in, in the law in a broad way with access to expert academic sources and also to the, the sort of economic and social data that, that is needed to back legislation, I, I think it, it, they have a very important function to play. And when it is known that a country's a jurisdiction's law commission is working hard at a particular topic, as for instance, reform of the rather chaotic English law of homicide, uh, that, that is a, perhaps a good reason, uh, uh, as occurred in a case I haven't mentioned, uh, for the top appeal court not to embark on yet another attempt to try and uh, define the, the borderline b between, in, in that case, uh, provocation and diminished responsibility, uh, but to, to, to wait and see what the Law Commission said. Diana Bryant, Chief Justice of the Family Court of Australia. Um, Lord Walker, to what extent do you think that the development of the common law, or indeed perhaps even its advancement, has been affected by the European Convention and other instruments that uh, affect the United Kingdom law? I, I'm sorry, a, a camera went off just at the, the, cru the crucial word, that has been affected by... By the European Convention and other instruments that... Uh, relevant in the UK? Well, in, in, in the UK, it, it has had a huge effect. Uh, the, the official prediction was that there would be a sort of mini tsunami of about three years litigation and then things would settle down. And it may be that the experience in Victoria has been a bit like that, but in the UK it certainly has not. The, the, we're now what, 12 years on and the 
the European Convention as domesticated by our Human Rights Act has an enormous effect and has, has even indeed, as, as I indicated in, in, in the field of uh, our developing law of privacy, uh, really been paradoxically a sort of statutory uh, spur to further development of the common law. So I, I'm not sure it's, it's completely pure common law, but it, it's, a, it's a mixture of the two. It's, it is a development of the common law under the influence of a statute incorporating a, an international convention. Don't be afraid, please. <laughs> How far do you think, my name's Annette Brennan, um, how far do you think that the law can intervene on the subject of phone hacking or privacy where something ends up on YouTube or some other mass media technology? Well, un undoubtedly, one of the big problems that all jurisdictions are going to face, but certainly the UK is going to face first of all, because it's, it's something that is very much on Lord, Le Lord Justice Leveson's uh, agenda, is that so far as the court is being asked to give relief in the way of prior restraint, uh, of, of stopping secrets being revealed rather than awarding damages after the event, the court is not going to act unless it, its order is, has a chance of being effective. And, and, in, in, and this gets into the whole region of what does it mean for information to be in the public domain. And the, the new information technology it has just brought a whole new world in there. And it, it's, it's wide open for, for discussion, I think. And I'm, I'm sure that Lord Justice Leveson, who, who certainly recognize the importance of all these modern uh, IT forms of, of instant communication between very large numbers of people is going to say something about that. It, it won't, of course, have legislative force, but it's something we're all going to have to think about. You were talking about the different common law jurisdictions and how it's uh, perhaps not trying to talk about one common law, but the common law of Australia yes. versus um, how influence is one common law, how influential is one common law jurisdictional decision on another, like does the UK, how much uh, does the UK take to account um, common law decisions in the United States in uh, judicial decisions in England? I know it's a very yes. wide topic, but... Well, the, the, I, the position in, in the UK is that we, we pay the most attention. I'm not saying it's just a flat here. It's, it's, it's a fact. We, we pay much more attention probably to decisions of the High Court of Australia than to any other jurisdiction, uh, partly because Australia has had to deal with the same sort of problems. It, the, its common law has developed at much the same speed. And because, um, or, or, uh, and because of the very high regard in which the, the High Court of Australia is, is, is held. I mean, uh, another area which I haven't mentioned, but in fact I'm, I'm going to speak uh, about at a seminar in, in, in Brisbane later, is the, the, the problem of pure economic loss and when loss occurs and, and the, the case of uh, Wardley, Australia, uh, is one that has been examined in huge detail by the House of Lords in, 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 in considering those cases. Uh, also New Zealand, to a less degree Canada, because Canada has its own Bill of Rights, which, which has gone in a very different way, and really a very, very little in the United States. But, uh, part, but we are often pressed to look at Sullivan and, and New York Times and so on, but the, the way that the jurisprudence on the First Amendment has developed is so different 
that I, it, you, an English court takes quite a lot of persuading to look at any, any American authority on, on the First Amendment. And it, it, if I, I, it, it, it struck me when I was reading that out, I didn't say anything about the common law of India or Pakistan or Bangladesh, uh, uh, partly because, of course, if you go back far enough, that isn't their common law. It, it, it was received as English law, and, and largely for that reason, and not so as to indicate any disrespect for any, any part of the subcontinent. I, I, but I, I don't think we, we get the odd case in the uh, High Court, in, in the Supreme Court of India, referred to on human rights issues, but not, not very much. Your Lordship, I appreciate this question has a very Australian flavour rather than the judicial system you're familiar with. But in recent years, the High Court's been delivering its edict on stare decisis, which requires inferior Australian courts to have regard to the decisions and the seriously considered dicta of other um, appellate courts and the High Court um, and follow those decisions and seriously con considered dicta except where they consider it to be plainly wrong. I was just wondering if you had any comments on that approach to stare decisis and how it might affect the development of the common law in Australia. Well, that, if I understand the question right, it, 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 is very much a question that depends on your federal structure in, in, in Australia. I mean, it, it's, it's the High Court saying that the courts of one state should take account of decisions of superior courts of other states, is it? Um, well, I, I believe it, it's, it's right to say that, that there is authority, high, high Court authority, that there is only one common law of Australia. So. It, if, if you take that as the starting point, it, it would be logical when it is a question of common law rather than, than statute law uh, for courts in each state to, to recognize that superior courts of other states are dealing with the same common law uh, and that, that they should be accorded at the least great respect and, and, and perhaps it, it's, it's not a problem that has arisen in, in the United Kingdom for, for fairly obvious reasons, although we, we do now are starting to have the, some of the problems of a federal constitution. And if the Scottish nationalists continue uh, to, to be a force in the land, those, those problems are going to become more rather than less acute. Uh, it, we, it, it is... Uh, it, it is um, But again, it's, it's not going to affect questions of common law because the common law of Scotland has never been the same as the common law of England. It's totally different from the common law of England. And it, it, it's, a, it's a minor uh, curiosity that Donoghue and Stevenson, which is the foundation of, of um, the English law of negligence, was in, in fact a decision on Scottish law. But th th there it is. I, I can't really usefully say more about your question. But it's, it's clearly a very interesting one. Robert Clark, Attorney General. In relation to your model about courts acting when Parliament uh, doesn't legislate, how do you factor in the possibility that legislators uh, may have uh, reached the conclusion that legislation is undesirable on the relevant subject? <coughs> well, um, th 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 that is, of course, a, a possibility, and that they, uh, we assume the legislators may have r reached that um, decision on more principled grounds, and it's not going to be a vote winner. Uh, but but if, if I'm, but I, I, don't, I don't, of course, mean, mean to, to be uh, facetious or disrespectful. If, if, if there is no legislative change, for instance, on the subject of assisted suicide, the, the courts must take that as a message, even, even if a, a tacit message from Parliament, that the law as it stands at the moment, is the law, and th that has, is the line which the courts have held, e even in, in some of the most heartrending cases. In fact, the, the, the Court of Appeal had two which it 
talk as vacation business only about three, uh, three weeks ago to two men, each of whom had what, what is called locked-in syndrome. Which their, their minds were completely active. Their bodies were incapable of any movement at all. And uh, each of them wanted to be allowed to die. And the court, expressing great sympathy uh, for them, uh, said there was nothing they, they could do. In fact, by what may or may not have been an extraordinary coincidence, one of them di then died of natural causes about a week after the judgment was given. But uh, if, if, if it is something as major as changing the law on assisted suicide, if Parliament does nothing, well, the, the courts have, have got to go along with that.